Vicki Markey and Duncan Quintus. My honor and pleasure is to introduce Beth, and uh, I got to meet Beth a long time ago when we had Rotary up at Spring Hill, our annual trek to Spring Hill Farming. She just did a wonderful job. Give you some other information about Beth Odell. You know, some believe that historians don't choose a topic to study, but the topic chooses them. Today's presenter, Beth Odell, feels that way about her research on the history of the town of Kendall. In this story of Kendall can be found two of Beth's primary passions, textiles and history. Beth is the former director of Spring, Spring Hill Historic Farm, home, the historic home, and the homestead of the Kendall founder, Thomas Rod, or as Margie has corrected me, Thomas Roach. <laughs> Beth is currently a reference assistant at the Maslin Public Library and a graduate student in library sciences at Kent State University. A year ago, Beth began publishing the Kendall Companion, an online publication dedicated to the history of Kendall's people, places, and things. She is the secretary of the Kendall 200 Steering Committee, which is organizing a series of events this year, in honor of the 200th anniversary of Kendall's founding. Today's presentation is among the first of those events Beth is uh, organizing. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause and please welcome Beth Odell. Museum. 
1941, he began intensive research on Kendall, utilizing the documents discovered by Irene Wales at Spring Hill Farm and other early records. Harrison planned to apply his artistic talent to the creation of a miniature scale replica of Kendall and also organized the volumes of notes he collected into a book. But Harrison's wonderful projects, so well begun, were prevented by tragedy. In January 1943, he was drafted into the Army, and on April 28, 1944, he was killed off the coast of England in a live fire practice, ironic, ironically named Exercise Tiger. Two months after Harrison's death, Ethel Conrad graduated from Oberlin College. Conrad grew up just four, four blocks away from Harrison on Maslin's 4th Street. In 1939, while a student in high school, Conrad was directed by Harrison in a play, and their two families were both active members of St. Timothy's Episcopal Church. In 1966, Conrad became, became head librarian of the Maslin Public Library. Irene McLean Wills donated the thousands of documents in the Roach Wales collection to the library, and over the next three decades, Conrad cataloged, repaired, and arranged for their proper care and storage. She also conducted extensive research on the lives of Thomas and Charity Roach, and in 1991, published an elegant biography of the couple entitled Invaluable Friends. Subsequent directors of the library continued the stewardship of the Roach Wales collection to the benefit of numerous scholars and historians. An effort to digitize, transcribe, and make the documents freely available online began begun over a decade ago by the library's current director, Sherry Brown, was significantly advanced in 2010 by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. This award was an important recognition of the collection's ability to provide unique insight into our nation's early development and will expand access to this amazing historical research source to future researchers in ways only dreamed of those of, by those that preceded them. And so I'd like to dedicate my remarks today to the memory of Irene McLean Wales, Ethel Conrad, and Frank Harrison, and to the honor of the institutions they serve, Maslin's Museum, Library, and Spring Hill Historic Home. All right, so getting the shakes under control. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Having told you a bit about the history of Kendall's history, I'd like to use the remainder of our time to examine the town in light of the remarkable era of its existence, an era in which our young nation experienced unprecedented social, economic, and political change. I offer you today a very brief bird's eye view of Kendall, its woolen factory, and their relationship with Maslin, and hope you will be inspired to swoop in for a much closer look as Kendall's anniversary year unfolds. The story of Kendall, Stark County, Ohio, is in large part a story of fevers. Some of these fevers affected the natural systems of the human body and others the dreams and aspirations of the human soul. Kendall's founder, Thomas Roach, described his decision to leave his native New England and come to Ohio in a letter to his brother. He wrote, I must go back to the time of our leaving New England on account of the repeated attacks of the spotted fever that so impaired the health of my dear wife that her physician considered it necessary that she should try a change of climate where the winters were less severe, and to escape the severe, <laughs> how about this one though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to escape severe weather of the then present one, we set out in the first month of the year 1811. And from the evidence of the benefit resulting from this journey, settled my determination to close my business, visit my friends at New Bedford, and remove. As might be expected, every inquiry was excited to ascertain the most advantageous situation for sheep and the establishment of woolen factories. And this I found to be where my present situation is, in Stark County. And so, to hear Thomas Roach tell it, he chose to settle in Ohio out of concern for the health of his wife, Charity, 
who had suffered repeated attacks of the spotted fever. But I suggest Thomas was suffering from a fever too, one that was an epidemic in the early 19th century, the persistent and often irrepressible Ohio fever. <laughs> this piece of land that we're sitting on today was permanently relinquished by Native American tribes in 1795. In that year, the boundary of settlement in the Ohio country was the eastern shore of our Tuscarawas River. In 1803, Ohio achieved statehood, and two years later, in 1805, the Treaty of Fort Industry opened all but the no northwest quarter of the new state for settlement. Land in Ohio was wild but fertile, and the federal government facilitated its sale by offering its purchase on credit. The majority of early land sales were to wealthy men who acquired thousands of acres at a time. Many of these purchases were done for speculation. They hoped to establish towns, villages, and services to attract new settlers to whom they could sell their massive holdings piece by piece for a significant profit. They planned to capitalize on Ohio fever. In the fall of 1811, Thomas Roach, then 40 year, four years old, purchased 2,838 acres of land in Stark County, Ohio from the Federal Land Office at Steubenville. Ultimately, Roach's land holdings totaled more than 5,300 acres. Roach may have had Ohio fever, but he was not delirious with it. He certainly hoped to make a profit from his investment in the West, but he was not purely a land speculator. Roach was above all things an idealist, and the roots of his ideals were firmly attached to the Society of Friends, commonly known as the Quakers. You see, Roach was a man of strong vision. He looked at the wilderness and saw a thriving settlement, a quote, place of considerable importance, whose inhabitants produced things of value for the betterment of themselves and their nation. But Roach could not foresee the, for the monumental changes that would sweep the country in the years ahead, nor that many of his fellow settlers would succumb to Ohio fever's darker fire. The plat for the town of Kendall was entered on April 20th, 1812. Roach named the town for one of the same name in Northwest England, an area known as the birthplace of Quakerism. In choosing to name his Ohio town after the British one, Roach was signaling his hope that Kendall, Ohio would one day be known for two things, its faith and its wool. Wool became Kendall, England's primary industry in the 14th century. In fact, Robin Hood's characteristic clothing is believed to have been made of Kendall Green, a woolen cloth of distinctive color. In 1812, Kendall, England was a textile powerhouse, producing cloth not only for <coughs> British consumption, but for foreign export. And it had become home to a Quaker meeting since the visit of George Fox, the founder of Quakerism, in 1652. Thus, the Kendall name was imbued with a significance and symbolism worthy of Roach's guiding vision. Almost exactly two months after Roach established Kendall, the War of 1812 officially began. Tensions had been building between the U.S. and Great Britain for years, and efforts to avoid war, such as the Embargo Act of 1807, had stemmed the importation of textiles from Europe. And while this had increased investment in domestic textile factories, it had decimated the Northeast's primary industry, shipping. The decline of this industry was a major cause of the Great Migration West. Roach, a Quaker pacifist, was a fervent believer that the development of domestic industries would increase our young nation's stability and tranquility, as well as offer alternative employment for those displaced from making a living upon the sea. The problem, however, was that the quality of U.S. cloth paled in comparison to the fine woolen cloth of Europe. One reason for this was that the U.S. did not possess the needed expertise and technology, a situation which was a major cause of America's industrial revolution. <coughs> Another issue, however, was the quality of wool. But a breed of sheep, the merino, would solve that part of the equation. 
The merino was first brought to the U.S. in 1802. Its wool was so fine and produced such a high quality cloth that Spain had forbid the breed's exportation. Before the Embargo Act of 1807, merinos were not in high demand, but after, there were not nearly enough animals to go around. This resulted in a speculative fever, known at the time as merino mania. <laughs> Thomas Roach got in on the ground floor of the merino craze and did very well. In addition to acquiring a flock of merinos, between 1808 and 1811, he acquired the facilities and machinery necessary to turn raw wool into finished cloth. Roach brought his large merino flock and his belief in the positive power of domestic industry with him to Ohio. The events leading up to the war greatly influenced Roach's vision for Kendall, but the impact of the war itself directed the town's character and fate in an entirely different direction. Many New Englanders of average means could not raise the money for a move to Ohio because there was no market for their land in the East. Others were discouraged by the often exaggerated claims of brutal raids on frontier settlements by Britain's Native American allies. The evidence suggests that Roach expected a flood of his new fellow New Englanders to his settlement once it was established. But the war had a significant cooling effect on Ohio fever during Kendall's critical first years, and relatively few families made the move until peace was restored. In October 1812, while General Elijah Wadsworth Army was camped between Canton and Kendall, brothers-in-law Thomas Coffin and Mayhew Folger were purchasing several tracts of land adjoining Roaches. Acting in partnership, they also purchased lots in the town of Kendall itself and plan to open a store and take up three mill suites, mill suites along Sippo for a cut nail factory, powder mill, and sawmill. They were both descendants of the original proprietors of the island of Nantucket, birthright Quakers, and former ship captains whose maritime exploits are worthy of a lecture of their own. Coffin, 46, had left the sea in 1800 and for 12 years had operated <coughs> successful businesses in Boston and Philadelphia. Folger, 38, the younger of the two, had been on land for three years and wanted to leave the gloomy business climate in Nantucket for better prospects out west. Both had large families who would greatly increase Kendall's population by their presence alone. The Coffins and Folgers were ideal examples of the types of families Roach wanted to settle in Kendall and he was so encouraged by their plans to join him that he used that fact as a selling point in his argument to win a post office. But only the Folgers successfully made the move to Kendall. A partner's business failure kept Thomas Coffin in Pennsylvania, where he died in February 1815 of typhoid fever. <laughs> it is interesting to note that one of our nation's most influential early activists <coughs> for women's rights and the abolition of slavery was Thomas Coffin's daughter, Lucretia Coffin Mott. She and her husband James had also planned to make the move to Kendall with the Coffins, but decided upon New York instead. Despite the war and the significant decrease in migration it caused, by March 1813, nearly half of Kendall's 100 lots had been sold. The town contained seven frame houses and a store, and three sawmills were under construction along Sippo Creek. In September 1813, Commander Oliver Hazard Perry declared, we have met the enemy and they are ours at the Battle of Lake Erie. And a month later, the settlers' fear of native attacks were greatly reduced by the death of the legendary warrior Tecumseh. During the fall of 1813, more settlers began tricking, trickling into Kendall, some to stay, such as the Folgers, and some to size it up in comparison with the many other budding frontier settlements. One of these was James Duncan, a handsome 24-year-old son of a prominent New Hampshire merchant who in 1826 would found a town by the name of Maslin. In 1814, James Duncan entered into a partnership 
for a flock of merino sheep on a farm they named Estremadura, after a region in Spain famous for the breed. This farm was located south of Kendall, part of which was land later occupied by the Maslin State Hospital. The partnership was formed to capitalize on Roach's plans for the Kendall Woolen Factory, the continuing merino mania, also called the fine wool fever, and Ohio laws that provided tax exemptions for wool and woolen goods. Others had the same idea, most notably William Dickinson and Vesalio Wells of Steubenville, Ohio. Wells was the founder of Canton and the man from whom Roach purchased the section of land on which he placed Kendall. As such, he was well acquainted with Roach's plans. But Wells and Dickinson's speculation went beyond sheep. They established a woolen factory, too. On February 16, 1815, the United States Congress united, unanimously approved the treaty officially ending the War of 1812. A month later, the Ohio Repository began publication in Canton. April 1815 was an eventful month. James Duncan dissolved his partnership, but he and the Merino flock remained at Estremadura. A new bridge was under construction across the Tuscararas, and Thomas Roach was visited by his nephew by marriage, William Logan Fisher of Philadelphia. At that time, Fisher was a budding, had a budding woolen business which he, which in the decades to come, would become one of the most important in the United States, a success for which he gave Roche, Roche partial credit. <laughs> in June 1815, the Kendall Woolen Factory began full operation. It is very important to note this date because Steubenville has long claimed to have had the first woolen mill in Ohio. But Wells and Dickinson had opted for the emerging technology of steam power and ran into trouble securing parts for the machine. In consequence, their factory began operation sometime after the Kendall Woolen Factory did, perhaps much later in fact. But the exact starting date of the Steubenville factory is yet to be discovered. Until proven otherwise, the Kendall Woolen Factory deserves the distinction of being the first factory to produce fine woolen cloth in Ohio. This is no small honor.